Man, I love Christmas time. Absolutely, bar none, my favorite uh, time of the year. And I especially, I love Christmas music. I know there's a joke out there that uh, after you know this holiday, people start playing Christmas music. I kind of like it all year round, if I'm just being honest. Uh, I have a couple of playlists on my Spotify account, you know, old Christmas songs, Christmas mix, new Christmas songs, and periodically throughout the year, I will play them, and we're nowhere close to Christmas at times when I'll play them, mostly because of some of the nostalgic feel that those songs bring back to fond memories I have with family growing up, but also because of some of the richness Uh, in the lyric of a lot of Christmas songs. Even some that we were singing this morning speak to the very message that we'll share together over the next few moments. I won, we were singing the first Noel not long ago, and I love that it says, Born is the King of Israel. Do you know some in Israel are still looking for the coming of their Messiah, Because they miss that Messiah has already come. So when we look through the scriptures, especially in this season, when we're talking about the first coming of the Lord Jesus, baby Jesus through a manger, it's important that we understand some of the scriptures that said he would come so that we can recognize that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises, not just to Israel, but extended to those that are not Jews, like me, by faith. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at what Matthew says about the coming of the Lord Jesus, just to reassure us that we indeed are worshiping the one who will return as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and his name is Jesus. So Matthew begins talking about what we often sing about as that silent night. Matthew begins his record in chapter 1 with a genealogy. Oftentimes, if we're not careful, or maybe I should say if I'm not careful, as I'm reading through the Bible, I get to a genealogy and. I often don't even peruse over it. I just skip over it. And then I move to the next part looking for meat, if you will. Well, I'm going to encourage you to take out your knife and fork today. And we're actually going to work through the genealogy of Matthew and mine or gain some of the meat that he actually gives us. Now, obviously, our time will not afford that we grasp everything all of the significance that comes to us by way of Matthew's genealogy, but we will look at three specific things in Matthew's genealogy. Before we do, it's important to note, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, you'll find it twice in the New Testament, one in Matthew and one in Luke. In Matthew, it's in chapter 1, which we'll get to in a moment, verses 1 through 17, and then again in Luke, chapter 3. If you read Luke's account, you'll see that he traces the lineage of Jesus through Jesus' mother, Mary, because he's writing to a Gentile audience, and he's tracing the bloodline. Well, we're going to look at Matthew's genealogy today, and it's important to note that Matthew uses a dynastic genealogy, and he traces... Jesus' roots through Joseph's side of the family because in a patriarchal society, it was important for legal reasons that Jesus came from the house of Joseph as the father so that it would be recognized in the legal manner. In order to do that, Matthew employs what is called a tactic in Hebrew culture that's called gematra or gematra. It it depends on what side of the Jordan you're from to how you pronounce that word, I guess. But gematra is a method of interpreting the Hebrew scriptures by computing the numerical value 
of the Hebrew consonants in a word. Now, why is that important? When you read through, and we won't read through the entire thing today. We'll we'll pick out some things of significance for our time this morning. But when you go back and you read through the genealogy that Matthew records, if you were to put it beside the genealogy that Luke records, you'll see that Matthew left out some generations. Somewhere around 20 generations that he left out. And what he did was he grouped the legal side, Joseph's side of the genealogy, into three different compartments, if you will. And in each one of those, he used 14 generations, leaving some generations out. Why would Matthew do this? Many scholars believe he used the tactic, gematra, for the purpose of accentuating David and the importance that Jesus was born in the Davidic line, in the house of David. Again, because this is a legal version of his genealogy. So why 14 generations? Why not 15 or 16? Why 14? Because the number itself in Hebrew would point to David, showing that Messiah truly must come, not just from the house of Israel, but from the line of David. So using Gematra, or, or Gematria, I guess is more correct in the pronunciation, we get the three consonants in David's name. In the English, it would be D, V, and D. In Hebrew, it would be Dalet, Wa, and Dalet. Well, in Hebrew, they ascribe a number to a letter. For example, in the English uh, alphabet, A would be 1, B would be 2, and so on through the 26 letters. Similarly speaking, this is done in the Hebrew alphabet. So the Dalet, which we translate to be D, is the number 4. Wa, which we would translate to be V, is the number 6. And then D, again, the Dalet. We translate to BD would be 4. When you add those up, it equals 14. When you look at Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, you'll see three different parts of the genealogy. And both of those, or all three of those, cover 14 generations from Messiah all the way back to Abraham. Or from Abraham all the way to Messiah. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 1 verse 17. The last verse in the genealogy Matthew uses to make sure the reader understands what he's writing and why he left some out. Look at verse 17. After stating all of those three different groups of 14 generations, Matthew writes, Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. That's the first set in his genealogy. Then he says there are 14 from David to the exile of Babylon. Again, inserting David's name in both of those sections. Singling out the importance of the line of David. If Jesus was not born in the house of David, he could not be the prophesied Messiah. So Matthew accentuates this in verse 17. And then 14 from the exile to Messiah. So that helps us understand why Matthew laid out the genealogy the way that he laid it out. Why? Just as we sang about moments ago. Noel, Noel, the first Noel. So we would understand Jesus is born the king of Israel. This is significant. If you go back into Israel's history, you'll remember that Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom referred to as Israel. There was the southern kingdom referred to as Judah. It's through the house of Judah that the lineage of David would pass. Well, if you go back and you study the kingship, the last king in the northern kingdom for Israel was Hoshea, Hoshea, H-O-S-H-E-A, Hoshea. But the last king for Judah, which is The tribe of Judah, which is the lineage that David would go through, is Zedekiah. And that was in 586 B.C. 
So the Jews were looking for their king. So when Matthew writes his genealogy, he is spelling out for the Jews that were longing for and waiting for the king of Israel to come. He spelled it out in such a way that if they were paying attention to the scripture and the spirit of God would lead them to discover that Jesus is this long-awaited king. Understanding that, the first thing I want to point out in the genealogy of Matthew, or in Jesus' genealogy, as Matthew presents it today, is that Matthew's record summarizes God's plan. Matthew's record summarizes God's plan. In other words, Matthew hits highlights that we need to understand to understand that Jesus is a fulfillment of God's overall plan for the history, not just of the Jews, but of mankind. Look in verse 1, and you'll see him again summarizing it for his Jewish readers. For Matthew being a Hebrew, he wrote his gospel testimony, the gospel of Matthew, for the Jews. He writes in verse 1, This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. So he summarizes the lineage into two patriarchs that are extremely vital for Messiah to be attached to, that to be able to be traced back to. And the first we see is that Jesus is the son of Abraham. He makes clear in verse 1 that his readers understand that Jesus, if you were to trace his ancestry, goes all the way back to Abraham whom God gave the promise to that Messiah would eventually come. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see the original promise. The Lord said to Abram. Now we know that God changes his name to Abraham, but at this moment he says to Abram, who would be Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And and I personally say thank you, Lord, for verse 3. Look at verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Listen to this part. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Messiah is to come not just for Israel, although he, will come, he came to Israel and he came through Israel to all the peoples of the world. Anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible teaches in Romans 10 and 13, shall be saved. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, but he is Savior to all people. That would include you and me if you've surrendered your life to him through faith in his finished work at the cross and the subsequent resurrection. Paul writes in Romans 1 and 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Again, Paul reminding us that salvation came to and through the Jews On that silent night that we now call Christmas. This is when Jesus came as a fulfillment of God's promise. Not only does Matthew summarize his plan by showing that his lineage traces to Abraham. But he gets very specific. And out of the 12 tribes, he shows which tribe that he would come through. And that would be the tribe of Judah. How do we know this? Because he says that Jesus is the son of David. So he traces Jesus back to a specific tribe and a specific line even in that tribe. He's telling his readers that Jesus is from the promised royal bloodline. That he indeed is David's son and will reign one day on David's throne. The psalmist writes about this in Psalm 89, 
verses 3 and 4. He says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Listen to verse 3. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The psalmist was declaring what God had promised before, and that is Messiah would come through the nation of Israel. He would be born to Abraham specifically through the line of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, it's recorded this way. When your days are over, this is referring to David, when your days are over, and you rest with your ancestors, that means after you've died and have been buried like those that have gone before you, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. As a Gentile, sometimes we may miss the significance of this. Not long ago, having been over in Israel and being tutored, if you will, by a Hebrew uh, guide that guided us around, I grow to understand and appreciate even more the significance of what Matthew is saying here, that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah who would be king of Israel, which we understand from later scriptures, not only Israel, but the Bible would teach in the book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, that one day he will return again as king of kings and Lord of Lords. So the first thing we see is Matthew summarizes God's plan for the people. And what is his plan? That he would send Messiah. He would send the child who would be Christ, which means Messiah or Savior of the world. And he would save all the people from their sins, those who would call upon his name. Second thing we see in this genealogy of the Lord Jesus is that Matthew's record shows God pl God's plan includes all types of people. Matthew not only employed the use of geometria, he also did something very uh, unlikely in his day in this genealogy. And he used five women in the genealogy. And some of you might say, why is that significant? In Matthew's day, a very patriarchal society, it was atypical for a woman to show up if someone were surfing around on Ancestry.com, you would see from father to father to father to father and so on and so on and so on. But in Matthew's account, he points out five females. One thing we might learn from that is women are not second-class citizens in the church. God has and does and will use females just like he uses males to advance his gospel calls. While we are different in the way that God made us, in our responsibilities are different, our giftings may be different, our value is equal. And God uses women just like he uses men. More notably, in the genealogy, is not necessarily that he used women, but the women that he actually used. Which should be a reminder to you and me that if God would use them, he would even use me. And also that he would use you. What do I mean? In verse 3, we see that he used Tamar. If you'll remember, Tamar was married to the son, first son of Judah, Er, and Er died. 
So as was the law, so that the line could be kept and a son could be born, then she was given to Onan, the next brother in line to be married. And then Onan was killed. Well, Judah looks at this. He has a third son. But the son's too young. He's, he's around about 10 years old. And he tells Tamar, you can get married to him later. But we read in the text, the context lends itself that he's actually manipulating her because he believes she's the reason that his other two sons have died and he has no plan to give Sheila to Tamar when he grows up to be old enough to be married. So he's trying to manipulate her. If you go back and study, it was actually his two sons that died because of their own sin, that Tamar had done nothing wrong. But Tamar, when she realized that she was being manipulated, she decided to take matter into her own hands, and she disguised herself as a prostitute, and Judah allowed himself to slip for a moment, slept with the prostitute that was actually his daughter-in-law, and through this deceptive, incestuous relationship, a son named Perez was born. Well, if you do a deep dive into verse 3 there, you'll see Perez as being highlighted with Tamar in Jesus' lineage. God would use Tamar, hear me, God would use you. God used Tamar, God can use me. Regardless of what our past is, if we'll surrender and submit to him, our past becomes irrelevant and he uses us in spite of who we have been or might be. He simply uses us for his good pleasure. Verse 5, we see that he used Rahab. Rahab, the Bible says, is a harlot. What does that mean? She was a prostitute as well. And not only was she a prostitute, she was a Canaanite. But God still used her to preserve the Davidic line that would ultimately usher in Messiah. Joshua's chapter 2 through 6, if you want to go back and read about Rahab. Then there's Ruth, if you read the book of Ruth, and you'll see that Ruth was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite, she was a Moabite, but God used her as she married Boaz to preserve the lineage of the Lord Jesus in the house of David. And then there's Bathsheba. If you read in verse 6, you'll see the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She was a foreigner who ends up at King David's request committing adultery with him and then gets pregnant and to hide this pregnancy, trying, David trying to protect his own sin, David conspires and then has Bathsheba's husband murdered. So through a murderous, devious, sexual plot, God still used Bathsheba. Just a reminder that God can use you and me. And lastly, under number two in your notes, we see that God used Mary. Matthew points out Mary in this genealogy. Now the significance of Mary is who she was and where she lived and who or, and where she was from. So Mary, we learn, is a virgin. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we're told that the Messiah would be born to a virgin. In Matthew chapter 1 and 23, we see that Mary is the fulfillment of Isaiah's promise. We also learn that in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, that the mother of Jesus was to come from a certain family. In Luke chapter 3, verse 32, as well as the text we're in at the moment, we learn that Mary was born in the line of David. We also see that she is to be from Nazareth in Isaiah 53. She's to come from this obscure little town from Nazareth. And you know, in the Bible it says, uh, the question was posed, can anything come good come out of Nazareth? Isaiah says something good would come out of Nazareth. He says that Messiah, that the Savior of the world would come out of Nazareth. We see that Mary was from Nazareth in Matthew 2 and 23. And not simply just Nazareth, but she was engaged to Joseph, whose family was born in 
Bethlehem, which is why we read in the Christmas story that they were migrating back to Bethlehem. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the prophet said that Messiah would come from Bethlehem. In Luke 2, verses 1 through 7, we read that Jesus is the fulfillment of Micah's prophecy. So as we understand the record that Matthew gives, it shows that God uses all types of people. Later in the week as I was preparing, I actually wrote out in the side of my notes, it also shows God's faithfulness. Not only does it show that God can use anybody to accomplish his purpose and his plan, it also reminds us of the faithfulness of God. That my life, nor your life, nor the lives of these ladies or anyone else in Jesus' ancestry can thwart the very plan of God. That what God says will come to pass with or without our help. But the good news is, is that God desires to use people like you and me. And what might be encourage, encouraging for some of us to note is that God, and we see it in this uh, ancestry, God does not look for ability when he picks people to be used to advance his cause. He simply looks for availability. And when we make ourselves available, he gives us what we need to be able to serve him in a manner that would honor him and build others for the sake of and the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Third thing and final thing we'll look at this morning that we see in the genealogy of Jesus according to Matthew. And that's Matthew's record substantiates God's promise for his people. Matthew's record substantiates God's promise for his people. It states, his record states that what God said is True, whether we understand it or not. Whether we believe it or not. I heard a preacher years ago say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Then he backed up after that and said, I think I said that wrong. It's not God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's God said it, that settles it. <laughs> and because it's a settled matter, I may as well believe it. Because what God said is true. Matthew substantiates that what God has determined is true. In the Jewish mind, a, leg a legitimate genealogy with real people was necessary to substantiate the claims that Jesus, or anyone else for that matter, would be the prophesied Messiah. The hopes of the Jews are anchored in the genealogy of Messiah. And there's a reason that some have missed it. This past week we had a lunch with the Ministerial Alliance that we hosted uh, here at Emmanuel. And we had a number of uh, pastors and, and uh, ministers in the area come and have lunch with us. And some of our men joined us. And one of our very own, Ted Kuschel, shared in that. And one of the things he pointed out as he was sharing Christmas in eschatology. Is he pointed out the fact that many of the Jews missed Jesus because they were looking for a political Messiah. And many of the Jews are still looking for a Messiah to come and establish his throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign. Well, I submit that the Bible would teach that this is true. That one day Jesus will return. We call that the second coming. And he will rule and reign forever. So maybe we need to lighten up a little bit on those who come from our, uh, our Jewish friends and go, how did they miss it? How did they miss it? Well, they're still looking for part of the prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. And you say, what do you mean? I want to introduce you to something that Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost and a number of others call double reference. It's where a prophecy can refer to two different events that are separated by an indefinite period of time. Here's the definition 
Dr. Pentecost gave years ago when he lived, few laws are more important to observe in the interpretation of prophetic scriptures than the law of double reference or double prophecy. It's when two events widely separated as to the time of their fulfillment may be brought together into the scope of prophecy. So what he's saying is we can read a prophecy and see part of it become a reality in this day and part of it become a reality in the future. In Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, a verse that Jews would have memorized over and over again as they were longing for the coming of their Messiah, he writes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, you might underline that part, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Very important as we understand eschatology. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now let me first uh, say that not everyone within the church, I'm not talking about Emmanuel, although it's likely true here as well, talking about Christendom as a whole, not everyone believes in a double reference. But it appears when we look at texts like this, that Jesus came the first time as what we would refer to as a suffering servant, where he would die on the cross for your sins and for my sins. Paul writes about this in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, when he said he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself taking on the very likeness of a man, clothed himself in flesh, and became obedient even to death on a cross. This we saw fulfilled. This is Isaiah 9, 6. This we saw fulfilled. And Jesus' first coming when he came on that silent night by way of a virgin. And then he would live the perfect life, die a sacrificial death, and be raised from the dead. And then he would ascend into heaven. And when he ascended into heaven in Acts 1, as the disciples were watching him leave, The two angels that were put there spoke. It says men in the text, but many believe it to be angels. Some believe it to be Moses and Elijah. Nevertheless, we know it was two agents that God sent to speak to the disciples as Jesus was was ascending. He said, don't worry. Just as he departed from here, he one day will return here. Many believe this to be a future event when the Lord Jesus would usher in what would be called a millennial kingdom, and for a thousand years he would rule and reign literally from Jerusalem. And this is why many believe that the Jews, as a nation, are still looking for and longing for Messiah to come. Because Jesus did not establish his throne physically in the house of Israel and rule and reign. And there is not universal peace as the Bible predicts it one day will be. As a result, they're still longing and waiting for Messiah to come. So much so that in Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, when are you going to come? When are all these things going to happen? When are you going to come? When are you going to restore your kingdom? In a Jewish mind, they only, know of, they only knew of two time frames. They knew of the time that they lived in and the future kingdom that the Lord would reign. And Jesus tells them, first he says about times and dates, you don't need to know. The angels don't even know, not even the Son, only the Father in heaven knows. But then he continues a discourse explaining what the time would be like before his return when he would come and establish his throne. And then in verse or chapter 25, verses 31 and 32, he writes this. When the Son of Man 
comes in glory. This is in his glorified and resurrected body. This is not as a suffering servant as he came the first time. This is when he comes in all of his glory and all the angels with him. He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep and goats. The picture for those that would see eschatology playing out this way is that one day in the future, and there's a difference on the timing of this as that people would believe, but what most agree on is that one day Jesus will return. And when he returns, those that have surrendered their life to him and are still alive will live with him forever in this new kingdom and he will rule and reign. And those who have rejected Jesus as Messiah would be cast into an eternal lake of fire, which we understand to be a real place called hell. The Lord promised that he would come, and he did. But he also promised that he would come again, and he will. Here's the question, and we prepare to close. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, the truth that's in it, even the truth we find in a genealogy. May you use it to speak to each one of us and change us as you desire us to be. Even this day, for your sake and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.